thank you guys, everyone. And thank you most of all for the gifts of the Spirit flowing this morning. That was, that's actually my prayer every, every Sunday throughout the week. But um, it was again my prayer this morning and, and to see that, uh, not just now for, for you guys to, to speak over me. I mean, it wasn't like, that's when I really noticed it. It wasn't that, but just gifts of healing and prophecy and words of encouragement, words of, words of knowledge, all of those kinds of things. That is, that is amazing. Love you guys so much. Thank you for encouraging me. It, it really, really, really matters. Thank you. And um, it's really awkward now to, um, to call you guys stubborn heifers. <laughs> no, um, we're continuing our series going through the book of Hosea. Um, I'm not calling you stubborn heifers, but um, if the hoof fits. <laughs> Oh, wow. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4. And we are going to continue going through Hosea. Um, again, Hosea is someone who God told to prophesy to Israel. And in order to, to really feel the prophecy, to, to really understand the prophecy to understand God's heart and to really be sincere, he told to marry a prostitute, not just marry a woman who would turn into a prostitute, marry one who was already a prostitute, who his, his love and his charms and his devotedness and his faithfulness would not turn or would turn at times, but then she would go right back to it. And his love and his relationship with her would mirror his relationship with Israel and his relationship with Christendom, you and I, all those who call ourselves Christian, all those who are God followers, Christ followers. And so as we go through this amazing book of Hosea, it is truly the gospel all of the Old Testament is the gospel, by the way. But, I mean, if I was to pick any book of the Old Testament that truly personifies Jesus, it would be this book. And so that's one of the reasons why we're going through it. Hosea chapter 4 is kind of the start in Hosea where he doesn't go, he doesn't talk as much about his relationship with Gomer as much as he's really now talking to Israel. But I just wanted to reaffirm that always in the back of his mind, always in his heart is his relationship with his wife. It's always in the forefront of his, of his mind, just as it would be to you and I, if we were the prophet speaking to Israel. As he says things to Israel, he's living it. He's feeling it. He's He's thinking about it. He's, he's saying, wow, as I'm speaking to you, I'm saying it to my wife as well. And I'm also saying it to myself because I'm this way to my God also. So Hosea chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. He says, hear the word of the Lord, you Israelites, because the Lord has a charge to bring against you who live in the land. So Hosea basically brings them into the court of law, brings them into a courtroom, and brings them before the great judge God and brings charges, against, God brings charges against them. So it's as if he brings all of Israel or figuratively all of Israel Maybe even in his mind, he's bringing his wife, Gomer, into a courtroom and he's bringing them before them and he's saying, here they are, God. And God says, I have these charges against you. Listen up. Hear ye, hear ye. Court is in session. And here are the charges that are being brought against Israel. And here are the charges being brought against you and I, against all 
people who call themselves God followers. There is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. Another way of putting it is no knowledge of God in the land. No one knows me in the land. You call yourselves God followers. There's no love. There's no faithfulness. There's no acknowledgement of me. There's no knowledge of me in the land. So he's high and lifted up on his throne. And he's looking out. And he sees everything that's going about. And he says this to them. This is what is going on. There is only cursing, lying, and murder. Stealing and adultery. They break all bounds. Another way we can look at that is they break all boundaries. All restraint. No rules, just right. Sorry, I like that restaurant too. <laughs> There's no boundaries. We cast off restraint. We do everything we want to do. We, we go to the furthest limit. That's what Israel did. And, and we can see in our day and age, in our society, in our culture, in our church culture, we do the same thing. When I worked at the Boys and Girls Club, we learned about uh, storming and norming and I forgot all of the forming and conforming and performing and I'm making up some of them, but uh, you get the idea of, of how when children get together, there's different things that they do. And it's the same thing for adults. It's the same thing for all of society, all people. And basically what happens is we all run for the fences. We all run for the border. And I don't mean the Mexican border and I don't mean the Canadian border. Eh? We go for the very furthest length and we see just how far we can go. Just how far we can get away with. We did it as kids. Mom says... Don't go all the way to the road. And we're like, is she looking? Is she looking? Is she looking? We do it with God too. God says, this is the line. And we start to cross over it. Is he looking? Is he looking? Is anything happening? Am I still alive? Am I still breathing? Maybe he didn't notice. Maybe he's busy. There's something in humankind that we break boundaries they break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed verse 3 because of this the land mourns and all who live in it waste away the beasts of the field and the birds of the air and the fish of the sea are dying but let no man bring a charge. Let no man accuse another. For your people are like those who bring charges against a priest. You stumble day and night. Not just during the day, but also at night. Or rather, not just at night, but also during the day. So it's not, not just because there's no light. You're, you're stumbling all of the time. And the prophets stumble with you. So no longer is a prophet holy. They're stumbling with you. So I will destroy your mother. I know that sounds awful. Like, wow. Whoa, God, chill, man. You're going to destroy my mother? That came out of nowhere. Remember we talked about that. Your mother means all of Israel. When he's talking to individuals, he's, he's talking to individuals, and then your mother means all of Israel. Verse 6, really important. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. 
My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. What is their lack of knowledge? They don't have a library card. They don't have the internet yet. They're not studying. They don't have the canon of scripture yet. They don't know me. And because they don't know me, they are destroyed. They are destroyed. Keep your finger here and turn to Romans 1. Keep your thumb, your finger, your neighbor's finger, your little ribbon that's in your Bible. Romans 1. You guys here? I just want to read what the Apostle Paul says about this very thing. Romans 1 verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature has, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse." So there's a certain part of the knowledge of God that is without excuse, just from creation. Not that we worship creation, not that we know everything there is to know about God from creation, but there's a certain part of God that is clearly seen, and it's without excuse. That's called general revelation. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their, their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. So the idea is any knowledge they had of God, they exchanged for other knowledge. They exchanged for other gods. They exchanged for whatever they wanted. They willfully exchanged. We're talking about the knowledge of God, acknowledging God. And I didn't do what I told you to do. Verse 24, therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. The knowledge of God they exchanged for a lie. And worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. So they, they served and worshipped with their time, their efforts, other people, relationships, drugs, alcohol, entertainment, whatever it might be. They may not have had a shrine in their room, but their devoted energies were for created things rather than the creator. That's our culture. Christian culture as well. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. In other words, he said, you want it? Hands off, you've got it. Remember, it started with, this is the wrath of God. We think of the wrath of God as, I see you, here's a bolt of lightning. Psh! 
in end times, the wrath of God is destruction and destroy, destroying things. But the current wrath of God in New Testament times is God lifting his hands and saying, have at it. God saying, I will no longer be with you. <sighs> That's scary. Why? Because they willfully said, I don't want to know you. I want to know this or them or it. I willfully don't want to know you. I exchange the knowledge of God for the knowledge of this. And this is what Hosea, centuries before the Apostle Paul, is prophesying to Israel. The very thing. Let's go back to Hosea. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6 again. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. They're destroyed. They're destroyed because God is no longer with them. They're destroyed because he hands them over to their own devices. He hands them over to their own lusts. He lifts his hands of protection from them. Because you have rejected knowledge... I also reject you as my priests. Even the priests are rejected. Because you have ignored the law of your God, I also will ignore your children. The more the priests increased, the more they sinned against me. They exchanged their glory, which was God, for something disgraceful. They feed on the sins of my people and relish their wickedness. They relished when the people sinned. Why? Because then, when you sinned, you had to bring a sin offering. You had to bring something to sacrifice. An animal, grain, things like that. And a portion of that, a tithe, had to go to a priest. So they relished when the people sinned. Because they would get fat and happy. In our day, it would be like this. I can't wait for this church to be filled and for everyone to tithe so I can get a better car. Not so that we can get larger so that, and you can tithe so that we can do more for the kingdom of God. No, so that I can be better off. That's what was going on with the priests. They weren't serving God and serving the kingdom of God. They were serving themselves. Verse 9. And it will be like people, like priests. There was no difference between the priests and the people. They looked the same. Now, we know from the New Testament, that there is no difference between clergy and quote-unquote normal people. They were all priests. But the idea is there was no difference. There, they should have been called to a different standard. There's, they should have been called to a different holiness. But there was none in Israel. I will punish both of them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. They will eat, but not have enough. They will engage in prostitution, but not increase. Because they have deserted the Lord to give themselves to prostitution, to old wine and new, which take away the understanding of my people. Verse 12, they consult a wooden idol and are answered by a stick of wood. A spirit of prostitution leads them astray. They are unfaithful to their God. 
So a spirit of prostitution is spiritual whoredom or idolatry. It's a strong attachment to that sin. And it leads them or us astray. Now, it's adultery because they never came straight out and said, God, we're done with you. We don't want to serve you anymore. They kept living a lie. They kept bringing sin offerings into the temple. They kept a facade up. They kept praying to God, all the while going after other gods, all the while prostituting themselves. Does that sound like some of the church? Does that sound like you? If so, it's a spirit of prostitution that is leading you astray. God is a jealous God. He does not allow that. He doesn't play church. Verse 13. They sacrifice on the mountaintops and burn offerings on the hills under oak, poplar, and terebinth where the shade is pleasant. Therefore, your daughters turn to prostitution and your daughter-in-laws to adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they turn to prostitution, nor your daughter-in-laws when they commit adultery, because the men themselves consort with harlots and sacrifice with shrine prostitutes. In other words, that's the example that they were raised under. They don't know any different. A people without understanding will come to ruin. Though you commit adultery, O Israel, let not Judah become guilty. So verse 15 to the end of the chapter, verse 19, we only have four more verses left. You still with me? All right. Four more verses. This is all to Judah. Judah and Israel are are a divided uh, kingdom at this point. And... Uh, Israel is to the north and Judah is to the south. I think I get that right. Sometimes I get them divided. Did I get that right? Okay. Um, And so verse 15 to 19 now is he's speaking to Judah. And so he's saying, though you commit adultery, Israel, let not Judah become guilty. So don't pollute Judah, in other words. And so now he's going to speak to Judah. Do not go to Gilgal. Do not go to Beth-Avon. Do not swear as surely as the Lord lives. In other words, and not mean it. Verse 16. Here's the payday, guys. Where I get to call people a heifer. Been waiting for that. I'm kidding. I'm not going to call anybody that. The Israelites are stubborn like a stubborn heifer. Huh. Huh. Sorry. Like a stubborn heifer. Do do you ever like come up to scripture like this and like, huh, I wonder what that means. Okay, God, what are you saying here? Right? As a teacher, I love scripture. And so I love stuff like this. Like, where were you going with this? Why did you tell Hosea to say this? Wasn't it enough that he had to marry an uh, an adulteress and and a prostitute? Wasn't it enough that her name was Gomer? Sorry. Now you have to, he has to, you know, basically call Israel a stubborn heifer. I mean, wow, man, poor guy. So like a stubborn heifer. So. What it really means is one that throws the yoke off her neck or draws back and slides the yoke off or backslides. So are you familiar with yoke on oxen or or cows? So first of all, um, so a bovine, did you know that bovine 
can be either a cow or an ox. How many people knew that? All right, good. Some people. So what makes them different is a cow gives milk or bears children, and an ox is for heavy manual labor. Otherwise, they're, some people just call them cattle, but they're bovines. So a, uh, specifically, the heifer is a, fem- a young female who has not born children yet. And so she sometimes is also used as an ox or to, to uh, be, be under the, um, the yoke. Thank you. All these words in my head. To be under the yoke and, and do main, manual labor. So the idea is that Israel is under this yoke, okay, like a heifer. But she's stubborn. And so a stubborn heifer is under the yoke, but it's going like this to get out from underneath it. And God puts her back in the yoke again to do work. To do work, to plow the field. And the idea is with God. God being on the other side of her. And Israel, or the stubborn heifer, or Christendom, or you, or me, continue to backslide, or be stubborn, and continue to get out of it, throw it off, throw off restraint, find that boundary, and go past it. Get out from that yoke. You're attached to the work that God has for you. And you break free because you're stubborn. This is the picture that Hosea has for Israel. And I believe that that God has for the church and has even for our church today. And he says... The Israelites are stubborn like a stubborn heifer. How can the Lord pasture them like lambs in a meadow? So in other words, what he's saying is if you act like a stubborn cow, don't expect to be fed and cared for like sheep. If we continue to break free from being connected to God then he's going to treat us like a stubborn cow. We're not his sheep. We're breaking free. Now, I want to tie this together with with worship. I was chomping at the bit. I wanted to get up. But I figured I was going to get up anyway, and it would tie in better right now. What was really interesting was The most famous or the most recognizable scripture about a yoke is in Matthew chapter 11 about coming to me all you who are heavy laden and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you for my burden is or for my yoke is light and and let me read it. It's one of those that is so poetic and so beautiful but I'm butchering it basically. Um, It says... Excuse me. It says, come to me, Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What's interesting, again, is it's the most recognizable scripture about a yoke. But I hadn't planned to to share it. It was just one of those that just didn't occur to me. It just didn't fit with, with my message. And when it came to me, when they were, when the worship team kept getting words about rest, 
that scripture came to me. And then when it came to me, I'm like, oh my gosh, why didn't I think about it earlier? It would have fit perfectly with my message. And I was like, oh, because this is why. Because God is moving, God is working. And then as I'm thinking about rest, and I was wanting to get up and share it then, then Brian got up and talked about being a pillar. And the work that a pillar does in holding a house up. I'm thinking, wow, okay, well, maybe I shouldn't talk about rest because a pillar does work. And then I was thinking, yeah, but a yoke is all about two oxen doing work. <laughs> you can do it. And the reality is this. What God wants all along for Israel, what God wants all along for us, what, what Hosea is talking to Israel about, what Hosea is talking to Gomer about, what God is talking to us about, what any marriage is about, what any relationship is about, what our marriage to Christ is about, is this. We rest in Christ as we work with him. We can be a pillar as we rest in him. I'm someone who all my physical and mental life struggled with rest. All my spiritual life struggled with rest. Just didn't know how to rest. Until a couple of years ago, I finally discovered and finally started to rest in Christ. Finally understood what it was to rest in Christ. Now I still have my bouts. I still have my struggles. I'm, I'm human as you guys heard. I know that was a shock to many of you. Um, but for the most part. I've learned to rest in Christ. Oh, it's so amazing. To be yoked to the Messiah. To be yoked to Jesus. To be able to. Be next to him and let him do the heavy lifting. He wants me, he wants you to be faithful to walk beside him. And to be united to him as he does the work. That's the idea of being yoked to him. Of being yoked to him, of, of walking beside him, of, of being united, of being... Under the same contraption, the, doing the same work, plowing that same field, that same ground, that same work. Being able to rest in him while he works. And that's what he's talking about here as well. Make no mistake, it is good news. Even as he's saying, you're like a stubborn heifer. He's saying, you don't have to wiggle out of your constraints. It's good. It's good that you have this yoke on. So the word this morning is keep the yoke on. Keep the yoke on. It's it's not that you don't have freedom. Freedom is in the yoke. Absolutely. We're in slavery when we get out of it. Verse 17. We're almost done. I just have to find our text again. It's after Daniel, right guys? It's a lot of pressure when everybody's looking at you. Verse 17, Ephraim is joined to idols. Leave him alone. This is where it can kind of get confusing. Not the only place, but in the Old Testament. 
Ephraim is one of the tribes of Israel, one of his 12 sons. Ephraim is the largest of the tribes of Israel. So when the prophet, or all of the prophets actually, but when Hosea is talking about Ephraim, he's actually using it as another name for Israel, all of Israel, because it's the largest. So he's not just singling out a portion of Israel. He's using Ephraim as a way of saying Israel. It's sort of like a poetic license, sort of like a, a way of saying Israel. Um, the same way that we can use a uh, thesaurus to use a synonym so that we don't keep using the same thing. Get it? Okay. So Ephraim is joined to idols. Leave him alone. Even when their drinks are gone, they continue their prostitution. Their rulers dearly love shameful ways. A whirlwind will sweep them away, and their sacrifices will bring them shame. So, last thing, I just want to talk about verse 17. Ephraim is joined to idols. Leave him alone. In other words, he, Israel, Ephraim, is joined to idols. Remember, he's talking to Judah. Don't go north. Don't mix with Israel. Don't be like Israel. Don't be like Ephraim. Don't get polluted like Israel. This is where it's a little difficult for us. There's this fine line between how do we reach people for the gospel and how do we stay away from the world so that we don't get polluted, right? It's hard. I'll give you a scripture in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17. A yoke again. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. This is, this is really popular, particularly when, when you're talking to uh, an unbeliever and a believer who are about to get married or are, are beginning to talk about it or in a serious relationship and you're warning them. Guys, this is serious. This is something that's really important. Don't be yoked. Again, together, you're, you're plowing a field together. You're, you're tied together in some serious stuff. This is different than just trying to reach them with the gospel, trying to be um, winsome to them. This is engaging in intimacy, not just um, marital intimacy, but friendship intimacy as well. There's two different things here. Look at Jesus's life. Jesus was winsome to everyone. He, he reached out to everyone. He, he loved everyone, but then he said, go and sin no more. But to the 12, he, he went on a mountaintop and fasted all night long before he called the 12 to be apostles. He didn't just call any 12 to be apostles. It's important that we make distinctions, that we don't yoke ourselves to just anyone. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Belial is another name for uh, Satan. It, it means the worthless one. Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Again, I want to make it very clear. What I'm saying is, don't have a Christian bubble and all of your friends are just Christian. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is your confidants should be Christian. The ones that you trust should be Christian. But we should have friends all outside in the world because we need to reach them for Christ. But we need to be yoked, doing work, being like-minded with Christians. Fellowship in that regard. I'm not saying having a Super Bowl party. I'm talking about 
sharing Christ and, and, and sharing, strengthening with one another and praying together and things like that. That's being yoked together. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Can I have the worship team come back up, please? So as we're doing this, again, picture yourself as the heifer, <laughs> as the the cow, the, the ox, part of having the yoke on is that we're yoked with God, but also part of this yoke is the people that we have in our lives, the people that we're yoked to, the relationships that we're allowing in our lives. The relationship, not just with people, but the relationship with other things. Are we allowing ourselves to be yoked to anything that is not God-honoring? Anything that would cause us to not be able to do the work that God has called us to do? Because what happens is when God is moving and plowing the proverbial field, we get stubborn. And we start trying to get out of it. Because we're wanting to go this way. Because we have a taste of something else. We get a whiff of the wind of something else. Or someone else. And we tend to like that. Because it's our sin nature. And it's, it's appealing to us. And so we become stubborn. Why don't we stand? Lord, we just want to serve you. We, we want to rest in you. We don't want to be stubborn, Lord. We don't want to be backsliders. Lord, we don't want to wiggle our way out of the yoke. Lord, we, we want to be connected to you. We want to serve you. And we want to rest in you. Lord, show us, convict us by your Holy Spirit, Lord, if there's anything in our lives, Lord, that is unpleasing to you. Lord, anything that's causing us to be stubborn, causing us to backslide, causing us to, to be interested in other things, other people. Lord, to be swayed by an adulterous spirit, Lord. Lord, move upon us right now in the name of Jesus. Hey, guys. So, who's a stubborn heifer? I'm serious. Come on, who's a stubborn heifer? I'm serious. Last night, he was talking about moving in the presence of God and how to do that. I never, nobody had made it so clear. It's so simple. It's so simple. Stop moving in the opposite direction. Stop cussing. Stop pornography. Stop trying to control. Stop not trusting. I'm done. I'm done. And I'm a stubborn heifer. You can ask Bev. You can ask my husband. You can ask my children. It has become very clear to me over the last 24 hours. And I've been told for years. I am not in control. I can't control Dana. I can't control my kids. All I have control over is allowing God to control me. 
<clears throat> I was reading in 2 Samuel this morning, and it talked about how it's just repeated so many times in the Old Testament about, if I don't say it wrong, God deal with me ever so severely if. What if we said that? What if we spoke that into our lives? Like, that would be commitment. That's what God wants. He wants that true commitment to move forward in him. In him. Maybe not in fear, maybe in love, like this beautiful song, or in rest. But when I look at the yoke, <laughs> I look at being strapped with God and being pushed forward. You cannot not move. You can struggle. You can try to pull back. But when he moves, you move. You move. Don't be the stubborn heifer. Don't try to pull back because he's going to have his way with you either way. Move. Move. Stop being distracted. Stop being distracted of the sins of the flesh and move forward in the spirit. Claim what is yours in Christ. I claim a secure marriage. I claim a godly man for my husband. I claim that my children will step forward in Christ for the rest of their life and put him first. Stop speaking devastation over your life. Stop speaking it. Speak truth. That's all I got to say. So let's do that. Let's do that. I feel like there's an activation. Like when we declare out, we're like, man, we're, we're proclaiming what we want for our future, right? So let's declare and say, we shut off the control, right? We shut off our own control over our lives. So God, we shut off our control, our own personal agendas. God, we lay it down before you. And we say, we take on your Holy Spirit to guide and to direct us, Lord. God, we repent from any control in our own lives, Lord. See, let's just say that. We repent from any control over our own personal lives, Lord. We lay it down. We lay it down. We lay down the control, God. We lay down the control. Our own agendas, God, we lay it down before you. And we receive, we receive your purpose, God. Jesus. We lay down the stubbornness, Lord. We shake it off, God. We shake off the stubbornness, Lord. We step up and rise, Lord. We step up and we arise, God. We step up and we arise, Lord. Just say that right now. Just say, I choose to step up and arise with you, God. We choose to step up with you, God, and lay down, and lay down control and stubbornness. And we say, no longer will you hinder me from seeing who I am in you. No longer will disappointments hinder me from seeing you, God. And we put on your lens of perspective. Your lens of perspective, God, in our lives. We say that. I choose to put on your lens of perspective, God. I choose to put on your lens of perspective, God. Yeah. See, I choose to put on your lens of perspective, God. And we rise up, Lord, 
and we rise up, Lord. Let's say that. I choose to put on your lens of perspective, God. I choose to put on your lens of perspective, God. Again, I choose to put on your lens of perspective, God. I choose to put on your lens of perspective, God. In our lives, in our lives, Lord, it's a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice. Jesus. It's a lens of perspective from the simple gospel, Lord. You've already paid it all, God. So we can rise up with you, Lord. It's a lens of a perspective from the heavenlies. She paid it all. Hate it all. Yeah, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for making a way, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that we can come into the throne room with you, Father. That we can sit upon your lap, Lord. That we can sit upon your lap, God. Mm. We can rest in you upon your lap, Lord. Yeah. 